Hey guys, Pastor Dave here. Hey, thanks for joining me. Uh, it's Wednesday night, praise God, on the 1st, and uh, we've got a lot to cover. I know that last week was a little bit confrontive, and you know what, I wish I could tell you that tonight's going to be less confrontive. It may be, I don't know exactly, we'll just... We'll go based upon what God has for us, but I want to thank you guys for spending the time with me. I know last week I jumped right at you, and I, I, I don't want, that's not my intention. My, this is not about reproving anybody. This is about just simply us addressing truth that we need to address and live in our lives. So as I'm preaching to you, please don't take it the wrong way. I'm preaching to myself at the same time. All right, let's start off in prayer and uh, ask God to guide this study. Lord, we thank you, God, for today. Father, for the opportunity you've given us to be in your uh, in your house, Lord, virtually. And God, I thank you for my brothers and sisters, Lord, that have joined us tonight. I pray, God, that you'll help us, uh, Lord, as we continue to study what it means to be a follower of Christ. Lord, I pray, God, that you will help us to have ears to hear and hearts that are receptive. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So as we continue, uh, we've been working through the aspect of what it means to be a follower, right? That's been the whole push of what we've been talking about, what we've been addressing. And we've been talking about last week, we were we started off talking about the strength of the human will and really the weakness of the human will, right? How we can't do things in our will. We've got to do things by trusting in the Lord. And we talked about what it means. And the reason why we talked about the will is because we find ourselves serving sin instead of serving God, right? Serving sin instead of serving God. And reason being, by nature, we are the children of disobedience. That's who we are, where we came from, right? Now, as a born-again child of God, that's no longer my identity. But unfortunately, my spirit might be saved, my soul might be saved, but my flesh is not. And my flesh still wants to be in the group of disobedience. And so what we've got to do is we've got to address that. That's what we're talking about tonight. So as we address this and we're talking about it, we're talking about the power of the will. It comes down to this. It comes down to the fact that as a follower of Christ, I have got to be willing to deny myself so that that obedience, uh, that disobedience that's within me, that sometimes wants to bring itself to the surface because my flesh wants certain things. Guess what? I've got to be willing and also able to deny it, right? And we're going to talk about what it means to recognize the things that we're going to deny. We're going to talk about some very specifics tonight, but it sounds pretty simple, right? In Christian circles, we hear that term, deny yourself, deny yourself tonight. And it, it's catchy almost, you know, hey man, deny yourself. And you I mean, we may joke about denying ourselves a Reese cup or Chick-fil-A or whatever else it may be. But when it comes down to this, the denying of ourselves is probably one of the most difficult things that any human being can possibly attempt to do. Now, why is that the case? Why is it so incredibly hard for us? Because we love ourselves, right? We saw that in 2 Timothy 3, 2. The fact that you and I, we, we love ourselves. We love ourselves. We desperately love ourselves, right? And the thing is, it's impossible to love ourselves and deny ourselves simultaneously. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. The two are, multi, are mutually exclusive. It just doesn't function. I can't do one and, and, and do the other and not have one cancel the other. What we find is, as Laodiceans, we try to attempt, I guess the best way to describe it would be a, a middle-of-the-road type of Christianity, right? Our holiness is kind of, kind of trying to split the difference between what the world would consider to be worldly and what God would consider to be holy. We kind of take the, the middle road and we, a lot of people would call it like having a balanced life. You know, I want my Christianity to be balanced. I want it to be balanced. And I want you to understand that God does not expect us to have a balanced Christian life. That is a concept that comes from the world. That is a concept that comes from the mega churches and all those folks out there that are religiously living. But bottom line is their lives don't reflect it. So we look at this, this idea of a balanced, a balanced Christian life. What I want you to know is God calls that being lukewarm. He says, you're not hot and you're not cold. You are, you're lukewarm. It'd be bad. I'd rather you that you would be hot or that you would be cold. Make take a stand. But the problem is we don't. So the Bible says here in Luke Revel in Revelation three sixteen. What did Jesus say to us? He said he would spew us. He said I will spew thee out of my mouth. Okay, what that means is that our version of Christianity in the Laodicean Church age, the final Church age, not to, and to explain that to you, the the Church ages. There's seven different churches that God writes letters to in the Book of Revelations in chapters two and three, and those letters actually correspond with physical actual churches from history, but at the same time, prophetically, they're speaking to the different church ages or the existence of the church over the last couple thousand years. So what we look at here is we're following along and we're seeing 
We are, you and I, we're in the last age. And that last age is the Laodicean church age. In the last age, guess what? God, all the other ones, they have a commendation in the letter. And then they have a condemnation. What you'll find is in the last letter, in the seventh letter, there is no commendation. There is no commendation for the good that they're doing. It just condemns them based upon where it is they're failing. And guess what? That's us. That's us. We are all in the same group. I'm with you, right? We are in the Laodicean church age, church age but we don't have to live as Laodiceans. We can make a choice to stand for the Lord. Because what we find is when we had this middle of the road mindset, this, this lukewarmness is the fact that we really don't stand. We really don't stand for God. And there's an old phrase that says this. It says, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for everything. And more often than not, that fits us in today's day and age. All of us, right? We watch what's going on in our world right now. We watch all the anger and the, the things on the news and the things on the internet and all the stuff that's taking place about unrest and, and rioting and all this stuff. And what we find is Christians are getting pulled right into it. People are, you know, I'm going to fight this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And guess what? People are choosing sides. God did not choose sides. He choose, there's lost and saved, lost and saved, lost and saved. God doesn't see division in humanity. We do. The devil does. The devil wants to point out all the differences. Between husbands and wives, he wants to point out differences. Between children and parents, he wants to point out differences. Between races, he wants to point out differences. Between uh, nationalities, he wants to point out differences. His desire is to divide us. And if we play into his game, guess what? We are going to be divided. But God says, if my people who are called by my name, right, we'll, re we will, we'll, get, we'll make our lives right. If we'll come to him, if we'll surrender ourselves, if we'll submit ourselves to God, God says he will do a great and mighty work. And what we find is that so many times, because we are lukewarm, we fall for the things that are set before us. The Bible says to walk by faith and not by sight, right? The, the, what I see around me should not impact my faith. Yet there are so many people who claim to be Christians right now who are on the internet and all over the world and in communities everywhere that are arguing and fighting over the garbage of this world, choosing sides. And God says, look, no, care about their souls, not the color of their skin, not their ethnicity, not their race, not their sexual orientation, not their religious beliefs, none of that stuff. Care for their souls because that's what matters to me. God would have all men come to the knowledge of the truth. God loves everybody. And guess what? That's our job as well. You and I, we're not judges. We're not judges. I can judge right or wrong. Yes, but I'm not the judge of man. Bottom line is God sent us here to reach them. And I don't care who they are, what they look like or what they do. My job is still to love them and still reach them. So getting caught up in divisiveness is not our place. Our role is to say, you know what? I know why I'm here. I'm to be on fire for God. Not cold, not lukewarm, on fire. That's why we're here. That wasn't part of my message, but God threw it in there. But more often, more often than not, we find people getting caught up in that mess. And we talked about last week, we used the light bulb example, right? We talked about the fact that you and I are supposed to shine. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven, Matthew 5, 16. And in that verse, what we saw was the fact that the, the light was put in God. God put it inside of us. And then what happened was the fact that it gets covered up, that's us. We're the ones that choose to cover the light. God doesn't cover the light. He put the light within us the light of God so that we could shine into the darkness to show hope to these people that are hopeless. So we saw that last week. And the problem is that you and I, what covers us up is our desire to feed our flesh. And guess what? When it comes to looking at the world, you and I, guess what? We want to be cool. We want to be accepted. We want to be, we want to be trendy, right? We're drawn to the things of the world and we should not be. John, 1 John 4, 5, we looked at this verse. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world. They talk about the world and the world heareth them. Look, they're a part of the world, man. They have influence. They have contact. They're a part of this system. If we sound like, look like, and act like the world, guess what? We may as well be the world. Why in the world would God set us apart to be a peculiar people? A royal priesthood for God's sake to reach the people with, reach the world with the glory of glorious news of the gospel. Why would he want us to look like them? He says we're supposed to be peculiar. That means I don't look like everybody else. But see, the whole point is we've got to, dis we discussed recognizing the traits that are in us so that we can deny those traits, right? And, and first of all, we saw the fact that you and I, we want to be first, right? We want to be first. We discussed how this is a driving force for us. It's an all-consuming desire to feed self, right? We have this thing within us. 
And what happens is we feed self, it becomes a hindrance to us serving God because guess what? We cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve both. You serve one or the other. You will love the one or hate the other, God says. So our world, guess what it does? It feeds it feeds our selfishness, right? It feeds our selfishness. The fact that your cell phone pops up ads specifically designed for you. If you want to see something, do something, guess what? It is at your fingertips. We have access to the world through the internet. So it feeds into our, our selfishness. So we've got to be careful of that. And what it does, and we discussed, is the fact that it develops what's inside of us that I label a me monster, right? And not only does the me monster affect our service to God, but guess what it also affects, as we talked last week, our reverence. For God and our reverence for God's word, our reverence for God's house. We talked about how in church people treat it as if they're, you know, they have more reverence in a movie theater than they do in church. Someone's preaching what God's given them, the very words that they're supposed to receive. They come to church and they've got all everything else on their mind, right? They're thinking about what they're going to have for lunch. They're thinking about, you know, what, what issues they have at home or a project they've got. They're thinking about all this stuff, but they're not focused on like God saying, hey, you know what? I've got something for you. I've called a man of God and I've given him a message from my word that you might hear it. And we come and we're not even paying attention. And we go to the movies and boy, we listen and we pay attention. Boy, it's a good movie. And we can quote back parts of the film, but we ask somebody, ask somebody after the, after a service, well, what'd you like about the message? What'd God speak to you about? Uh, um, I like the part about Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, I like that part because that's what they're checked out in the service. Guys, God says, look, give this time to me. This is for you to grow. It's not about that. God's saying, hey, let, let this speak to your heart. And as you let it speak to you, guess what? Your reverence and your understanding of the word gives God glory. That's the purpose of the message. It's a worship service that God receives worship. It's not about us coming and getting because we're Laodiceans. We think it's for us, but that's just not the case. It's not for us. It's supposed to be for God. So the world feeds our selfishness on the me monster. Guess what? He starts to swell up. And what we'll find is after we get saved, oh my goodness, our desire to be first, it just transfers into the church, right? That's who we were outside of the church. We wanted to be first. And then we get saved and all of a sudden what would happen? Well, amazingly, as Laodiceans, what we do, we convince ourselves that our service to God is is for him when in fact it's it's for ourselves, right? We're doing what we do in the name of God because guess what? We desire recognition. We desire recognition and we will do it in the name of God. The me monster just changes clothes, man. He dresses up, puts on a suit, puts on a dress. The me monster gets a nice haircut. Oh man, he looks good. He looks acceptable. The me monster carries a, carries a Bible. The me monster learns some verses, but guess what? It's the same me monster just camouflaged to look different. And what we find is the exact same stuff. What happens is we switch our method of self-promotion by masking it with a title, Christian. Guys, it's such a seductive and sneaky thing. It works its way into our lives. If we're not careful, it will bring such destruction and waste so much time that God has for us to reach the world. But, so here we are still seeking glory. Now what happens, this is how it starts to show up, how godly we are, right? how godly we are. What's our testimony, man? What we wear, man, that, that speaks, right? Uh, uh, my Bible, how much Bible knowledge I may have. The things I no longer say, hey, man, I don't cuss anymore, man, God, you know, God, but we make it about us. The things I no longer do. How about how long maybe I pray? Mm. How about how faithful we are to church, right? And we find these things and we do them, and we do them sometimes not because we want to honor God, not because we want to love him, but because we know we're supposed to, because guess what? We know people are judging how we act and what we do, and God's saying, hey, you know what? Do this for me. Don't worry about anybody else. Do it for me. And then you'll get to point stuff like this. You know what? I wonder if the pastor's wife even knows my name. What about me? What about what about me? It'd be, would, would it kill the pastor? Would it, would it kill him to mention all the stuff that I do around here? Just give me a little, a little pat on the back. Hey guys, I'm not saying there's not something, there's nothing wrong with appreciating what people do. But what I'm telling you is if you're doing it for that reason, you're off track. And the reason why I know so much about this is guess what? That's who I was. 
Guys, I got saved, man. I was on fire for the Lord. I was fired up. I was telling people. I was sharing the gospel. I was a zealot if there ever was one, man. And I was out there everywhere we went, man. I was talking to people about the Lord. And what happened was the the, the pastor of the church said, hey, you know what? I'm just I'm seeing what you're doing and all that's going on. Man, you're really on fire for the Lord. I'd love you to come in and start helping out around here. And I started helping out. And you know what started happening? I started getting all kinds of pats on the back. And over a period of time of getting this, and being on fire for the Lord, and the more you were, the more pats you got on the back. You start to do it not for God. You start to do it for the pat on the back. You start to do it for the recognition. And you start to let the me monster take over. Where I was submitted and humble before God in the beginning, over time, because of my pride and my desire to be recognized, I wanted to be seen, I wanted to be reverenced, I wanted to be celebrated. Guess what happened? The me monster swelled up inside of me. And what happened whenever that pastor left, the new pastor came, and he didn't give me the recognition that I wanted, I was mad. I mean, I'm talking angry. I do this and I do that and I do this and I do that. And you guys have heard the story before, but maybe some of you haven't. And one day I was walking through the parking lot. Nobody was there and I was picking up trash. And I was sitting there going, man, you know what? I wish he would drive in here and see what it is I'm doing, right? And God, like I'm telling you, it wasn't, a, it wasn't an audible voice. But buddy, I'm telling you, God spoke to me in that moment. And there's a verse that he said right into my heart in Colossians 3.23. He says, for whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. And God said, David, why are you doing what you do? Why are you doing what you do? If it's for you, you're wasting your time. If it's for me, stop complaining because I see it. And I'm telling you what a revelation that was. What a moment to be set free. And realize, guys, that's true in every aspect of our life. Don't worry about getting recognition. Don't worry about seeing you and somebody lifting your name up. It does not matter, right? It does not matter. God sees it. Do it for him. And guess what? He sees it and he appreciates it. And guess what? He will reward you for it. Do it for God. Do it for God. Do it for God. Because if we're not careful, guess what? We will become, just in Matthew 23, 27 talks about it. He says that they are whited sepulchers. He's talking to the hypocrites, to these Pharisees. And he says, you are whited sepulchers. And he says, yet you are filled with dead men's bones. You look all whitewashed and beautiful on the outside. But in reality, what's inside of you, your heart is death and iniquity. And what happened to me? Guess what? I looked the part, dude. If you'd have seen me, you'd have never questioned that I was living for God. The way I dressed, the way I acted, the way I spoke, the things I said, the things I, all, everything would have matched. The me monster had camouflaged himself so well that he looked the perfect part. But the problem was inside of me, I desired to be recognized and I lost sight of who I served and started serving me. Be careful, be careful, be careful. Because what happens, we get so focused on the appearance of godliness that we lose sight of what it actually means to be godly. Let's do it for God, man. I'm so thankful he woke me up. Because guess what? I could have stayed in that stupor for another 30 years. There are people that are still in it right now in a legalistic mindset that are all about the way things look and all about the exterior and all about the exterior, all about the outside. It is not about the outside. God's concerned with the heart. Man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh on the heart, on the heart. So as we desire recognition, that's a matter of the heart and we have got to be careful who it is we're doing it for. And as I said, Colossians 3.23, man, whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. Okay, we're still in our review. We're almost about to, we're about to be done with it. I hope this is helpful for you to, to get a review every week. I love to do this. It gives us an opportunity to kind of dig through it again and allow me to go through it again to make it uh, more applicable. I remember what we saw. So we had James and John, right? And, and that was in Matthew 10, verses 34 through 37. And what we saw in those verses was the fact that James and John were talking to Jesus and Jesus is listening to them. And what happens? They said, look, we want to be set apart. We want to be made special. He said that, uh, verse 37, it says this. They said unto him, grant unto us that we may sit one on thy right hand and the other on thy left in thy glory. Hey, Lord, will you lift us up and make us special? We want to be first. Check this out, right? So the other disciples, they're listening and they hear the whole exchange between James and John and Jesus. And this is their response in Mark 10, 41. And when the 10 heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. They were upset because guess what? They all 
wanted to be first. Everybody wants to be first. Guys, it's a picture of us. We see it within them. And guess what? It's a part of us. And these men were walking with Jesus Christ. They were his disciples. And guess what? As his disciples, we struggle with the same stuff. The same stuff. So we as Laodiceans, right? Because of all, because of our love of ourselves, first we do, we do desire to be first, right? Instead of allowing God to really strip us down and humility and pride and, and tearing those things down so that we can really, really feel God's draw in our life. Because guess what? God's drawing us. As you and I are off track, hey man, God's not just letting us slide. The Bible says that he chastens them who he loves. He loves his children. He loves us. So God's chastening us. He's trying to draw us back to him. He's trying to get us out of this Laodicean church age. He's saying, hey, I want you to be hot. I want you to be hot. Stop being lukewarm. Get out of that stuff. He actually says it in, in later on in Revelation 3. He says, I stand at the door and knock. The sad thing is most churches, Jesus isn't even in there. They're in there celebrating and he's outside knocking. If any man will hear me. Right? Say, and let me, he said, I will come in with him and sup with him and he with me. He says, look, you know what? Let me in your heart. You're so consumed with yourself. You don't even realize that I'm not there. You're so hung up in your religiosity that you can't even tell that I'm not even present. Your celebration is for me, but guess what? I'm not even there. It's like having a birthday party for somebody you did not invite. It's crazy. Absolutely crazy. So here we are. We're in church. God's drawing us. We're sitting in a service, man, and God's drawing us to repentance. And amazingly, amazingly, you and I, as Laodiceans, we can go through the motions of contrition. We can be brokenhearted in the seat. We might even come down to the altar. We might even shed tears, emotionally engaged in the moment. And we might pour ourselves out in that time. And we're heartbroken. But then we get up and we walk out the door and there's no change. There's no change. Because we wanted some kind of penance. We wanted some kind of, well, I want to show that I'm, that I'm, that I'm going to make a change. But the desire was not within our hearts. It was in our minds to say, you know what? I need to stop doing this. But then we go right back to doing it. And what's this? It's that, that song from, from Casting Crowns between the altar and the door. And what he's talking to me he says, you know what? So many people come to the altar, man. This is a life changing moment. This is it. This is going to redirect my whole Christian walk. And then by the time they walk out the door, they've forgotten. And they says between the altar and the door, everything changes. So not only do we struggle with our desire to be first, right? Prior to salvation, we also desire, number two, we desire to receive glory. We desire to receive glory. Oh boy, oh boy, this is this is a big one, right? Listen to Paul addressing the human weakness, this human weakness within himself in 2 Corinthians 12, verses five and seven. I love how Paul uses himself as an example and we all should share stories of our failure because guess what? This Christian life, we're gonna be full of failure because nobody's perfect. Nobody's great at it. We're going to do every day. We're going to press towards the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. But listen to Paul here in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 5 through 7. Of such and one will I glory. He's talking about the Lord. He says, I'm going to glory in the Lord. Yet of myself, I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. He says, I'm going to glory in my infirmities because God, Paul understood that through infirmities, God was working his life. For though I would desire to glory, mm, I want to get glory. I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be. He says, look, you know what? I don't want to receive glory. I don't want to put myself up on a pedestal. I want people to think more of me than they ought to, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, because here I am sharing the word of God, the truths that God's given me. And as I share them, people might start to lift me up. And he says, and because of that, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, right? The messenger of Satan to buffet me lest I should be exalted above measure. What Paul is saying here is he said, God blessed me with a physical malady. He blessed me with it because he wanted me to remain humble so that he could use me. That's the difference. Paul recognized the me monster within him. And he says, like, you know what? I'm not going to allow it to be fed. The problem with us is we go out looking for ways to feed it. We go out for looking for ways to satisfy it. We must recognize the fact that our me monster wants to be recognized. He wants to be celebrated. He wants to be lifted up. And it's amazing how much glory we can gain for ourselves in the name of God as we pretend to serve him. I'm telling you, back when I would do the, the, the works that I did and, and, and serve and do all these things, in my mind and in my heart, I did not realize that I was doing it for me. But I'm telling you, when God showed that to me, it was like a flashback before my eyes, seeing all the things that I'd done for the recognition of man and the self 
that I was feeding. God says, look, deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Deny yourself. And it's dangerous, man. I'm telling you, religiosity, buddy, that's a dangerous place. Because guess what? You can get yourself, your pride fed, and we can pretend to serve God when we're in actuality serving, serving our flesh. And listen to this. But we learn to do this. This is something that we learn to do. 1 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 5. He says, but with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you. And he says, or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self. For I know nothing of myself, yet I am not hereby justified. But he that judges me is the Lord, right? This is important. He says, therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come. But it says, who both will bring to the light hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. What this is saying and why I read that to you is because of this. What Paul's saying is, look, you know what? Instead of celebrating mankind, celebrating what they're doing, you know, somebody preaches a good message. Hey, man, praise God. Great message, right? Great word. Hey, it might have been a great word, but we don't know necessarily their heart behind it, right? Were they humbly doing what they were doing? And what by God, what Paul's saying is, he said, look, you know what? Instead of celebrating humanity, why don't we just let God deal with it? Because God understands the heart. Remember, it says, and it says here, um, he will make manifest the counsels of the heart, verse 5. And then shall every man have praise of God. So let God lift them up. Let God give them their reward, not in this life. Because guess what we can do? We can help people be drawn into their pride because we're all weak to it. So we need to be careful about building people up so much. Remember, it's about appreciating people, absolutely. Loving people, absolutely. Being encouragement to people, absolutely. But at the same time, don't lift them up too much because it becomes dangerous. So Paul is saying is nobody... Uh, really knows someone's heart, but God, uh, only only God knows their heart. So why don't we let him recognize their works? And if we're really doing it for God, really, we'll be okay with that, right? If we're frustrated by the fact that we're not receiving recognition, we need to check our heart. We need to check our heart. Because if we're truly denying ourselves, we desire for God to get the glory and not us, right? And you see the me monster? Guess what? Subtle and sneaky, subtle and sneaky right? When we have our opportunity to bless someone, think about this, right? We have an opportunity to do something kind for someone. And amazingly, because we're Laodiceans, we cannot wait to tell someone what we did. Why? Why? Why do we want someone else to know? Can we not just bless someone and keep it to ourselves? It's because we want God, uh, because we, is it because we want God to get the glory? For what happened, or is it because we want some type of recognition? Our, in a, even if it's in a small part, we're dying for someone to see it. We want someone to recognize it. We want someone to celebrate our good deeds. Remember, we do what we do that God receive glory, right? We talked about it last week in Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And what happens? And glorify your Father which is in heaven. When your heart's right, God receives glory. When your heart's wrong, you will steal the glory for yourself. Why do we want? Why is it that we want to be first? Why is it that we want to be in first place? Right? Is it really for God? Is it really for God? When we do this and we serve ourselves, we've got to be so careful, right? That aspect of serving self is something that can work its way into almost every aspect of life. So we're constantly humbling ourselves before the Lord as we seek His truth, His knowledge his word, and we let it speak to us and recognize who we really are and whose we are and who it is we're supposed to bring glory to. So not only do we desire to be first, but we desire glory. We desire glory, right? Then on top of that, number three, we desire occasion. The Bible calls it occasion. Occasion would be an opportunity or maybe like a platform, right? It's an opportunity, a place for maybe making a name, making a name for ourselves, right? So a, a desire occasion. This could be like a title, a position, a responsibility, something like that, right? It could be even something like humility, like how humble we are. We want recognition for that. Paul addresses this mindset in 2 Corinthians 11, verses, verse 12. He says, but what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. He says, look, I am trying to do what I'm doing and I'm preaching truth and I'm trying to tell, to preach God's, God's, the gospel so that cut off these people that are trying to make, take advantage of the situation 
to make themselves something special, right? He's trying to knock this off. These folks are looking at how they can use sub situations and circumstances for their own advantage instead of seeing an opportunity for God to receive glory, right? And I gave you an example. Let's imagine, right? We're out and, and, and we meet somebody and we find out that they're struggling, right? And they have to, they have to sell something that they belong and they're willing to sell it for a dirt cheap price. We know it's undervalued. We know that they're selling it because they have to. Let's say it's a car, right? And we go to them and go, man, you know what? What a great deal. Now, I know for a fact they're selling it to me for less because they're in a desperate need. And in that situation, I can get to make a choice, right? I get to make a choice. Could I compassionately give them more than they're asking in the name of the Lord to bless them, right? Could I do that? Or could I take advantage of the situation for my own gain because it's for me? If I gave them more and I gave them what it was worth, God receives glory. If I get a great deal, right? I get a great deal, man. His loss, my gain, right? It's the mindset of the world. If that's us, guess who's being fed? The me monster. He's in there and he is, he is hungry or she is hungry. There's both, right? So what if we give him full price? The name of the Lord would be lifted up. And the thing is, what would be the perception of the Lord? In that instance, let's say they're lost and they're just blown away by the fact that they said, you know, hey, I'm asking $10,000 for this car. And you said, you know what? I know it's worth a lot more than that. I'm going to give you 12. Holy cow. What difference would that make? And would they always, would they, would they tell that story? Would they share it? And you made a point in saying, you know what, God, you know what? The Lord would have me to give you more. And they would share that story and say, you know what they said? They said the Lord would have them give more. And who gets glory? Not you. God. Hey, man. Anyway, occasion, right? Occasion. Occasion. Looking out for ourselves instead of others. Me and mine, right? I thought about this as an example of this, of this, uh, in a physical way would be toilet paper, right? <laughs> we, we just come out of the, the whole COVID thing. And what happened? Boy, you go to the grocery store. If there's a bunch of toilet paper, people are buying five and six for themselves because guess what? It's about me and mine, me and mine. And guess what? That That's occasion. That's selfishness. Taking a position in the church potentially can also become the same thing because we're doing it for reputation, right? We want to be seen. We want to be honored. We want to be respected. This is the mindset that drives us to make a name for ourselves. And what we want to remember is that uh, we want to be remembered for the impact that we had instead of having the heart of a servant who would go unseen. We must be careful. We must be careful. I'm warning you. I'm warning me. We're all susceptible to it because the me monster is hungry. He is hungry. And this leads us to our next desire, right? So not, not, not only do we want to be first, not only do we want to be have glory, not only do we want occasion, but number four, we desire to make a fair show in the flesh. A fair show in the flesh. Galatians 6.12 says this, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. This is about appearances, appearances, appearances. Notice the, the key phrase in there, in the flesh. Make a fair show in the flesh. Is our service to God what is it true or is it service to our flesh? Are we serving the Lord? Are we serving our spirit? Are we serving our flesh, right? Can we think of uh, maybe how long we pray, right? I mentioned that a minute ago as we're sort of seeking that internal glory. But how hard is it if we spent hours praying, if we prayed for two hours this morning, how hard would it be for us not to work that into the conversation somehow? Some way, somehow, somebody needs to hear how long I prayed this morning, right? Now, if you're praying for somebody and you want to encourage them, hey, man, I prayed for you this morning. Well, praise the Lord. It's a, that's an encouragement for them. But what happens, we've got, again, it's a subtlety. It's a subtlety because we've got to search our heart, right? If I share the fact that I spent two hours in prayer because I was earnestly, honestly crying out to God for your soul and for 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 your for for God to bless your family, and you know what? I want you to know that I'm brokenhearted and I will continue to pray, and God's going to do a mighty work. And if my heart is pure and my heart is true, guess what? That is not a problem. That is not a problem. But guess what? When I do it, and when I get done praying, and I'm looking for a way to work it in the conversation, 
not for God's glory, not to encourage them, but to receive recognition for myself, for them to see me, it becomes a problem. Now, we've got a few more we're going to go through that are going to address what we need to uh, to deny. I thank you guys so much for spending the time with me this week. I know I, 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 I felt of lighter heart this week, so praise God. I hope that last week must have impacted us in some way, help us to make some changes. Uh, I feel much more uh, encouraged, uh, let's say. But Lord, let, let's be careful of these things because you know what the problem is with encouragement? It builds up our pride. We start to think we've arrived. Understanding the fact that we have failed and we fail every single day and we're not worthy to be God's children, guess what? Keep that mindset. Keep the fact that, you know what, when you look into the perfect law of liberty, when you look into that Bible and it shines back to you, your failures, and you hear them, don't let that just be information. Let it transform your heart. Let it speak to us. Because that's why this is here. God wants to transform us. This is the mind of Christ. And if you were to have the mind of Christ, guess what? This needs to be inside of you. Allow the word to speak to your heart that we might be more like him. All right, we're going to stop right there. We'll pick up next week on number five. Actually, we haven't even finished number four yet. And uh, so cliffhanger, and I'll see you guys next week. Let's pray, and I'll let you go. Lord, I thank you so much for tonight, and God, the opportunity we've had to spend in your word. Thank you, God, for encouraging us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for also challenging us to be careful of the desires of our heart, Lord. So many times uh, we are feeding the me monster when we do it in the name even of God. It's amazing. How as Laodiceans we can fool ourselves and deceive ourselves. But Lord, I pray that you do help us this week to check our own hearts. Lord, help us to stand for you. Lord, that we not fall for the things of this world. The devil set traps all around us. He sets lures and temptations. God, help us not fall prey to them. Fall prey to our fears. Help us to walk by faith and not by sight. As we do face this world, Lord, not as a combatant. We face this world, Lord, as a uh, as a as a as a medic going out on the battlefield and dragging the wounded to the Savior. God, help us to go out this day. Help us to go out this week, Lord God, that we might stand for you and love this broken world. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys. See you next week.